When he first preaching, Sergeant Waters. Who's dead? Who? Well, she was killed? How? Where is it? Where? What's the address on You are by transcription in the muster yeah. room of the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Just stay right where you are. The officer will be right there. Yes, right away. They'll take care of it. Yeah. Right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was doing day duty, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. When I arrived at the station house, I signed the blotter, read over the reports and communications that had accumulated since I went off duty 24 hours previously. Sharply at 8, I walked into the muster room, turned out the platoon for the day tour. As the men marched out the door to take over their posts, Sergeant Rosen, the patrol sergeant, indicated he wanted to see me. I came around from behind the desk where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer. And Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. Crossed to my office where Sergeant Rosen was waiting inside. Sergeant, that was a pretty sloppy turnout. Was it, Captain? You know it was. Now, I want the men turned out in a military manner. Get some snap into them. Yes, sir, I will. Uh, what is it you want to see me about? It's about Bradley and Warren, Captain. Mm -hmm. Bradley went sick today. Saw it on the roll call. Yes, sir. And what about them? Well, they've been riding together in sector car two. Bradley is operator, Warren is recorder. Yes? I noticed they haven't been getting along so well together. Always scrapping about who's going to take what pinch and so forth. No complaints to me from either of them, but I could see what was going on. I warned them they'd better knock off or I'd talk to you about splitting them up. That didn't stop them. They were still scrapping yesterday. Well, what about Warren? Is he on the job today? No, sir, he's swinging. All right. Next time you get them together, bring them in here. I'll have a talk with him. Okay, Captain. <clears throat> 21st Precinct, Captain Cronin. Sergeant Waters on TS, Captain. Looks like we got a bad homicide. Where? 695 Park Avenue. The board's jammed up, Captain. All right, I'll be right out. We got a homicide, 695 Park Avenue. Better get over there. Oh, wait for me. I'll ride with you. Yes, sir. You hold on a minute. I got to take another call. Oh, in a second, Captain. 21st Precinct. No, we don't have any information on that yet. We don't even know the name. That's right, 695 Park. Well, that's all we know about it. The call came through CB. I caught it on the air. Okay. I'm sorry, Captain. That's all right. What do we got? It came over the air. There's signal 32, ambulance responding. I rang down to CB, and they told me a woman called in. A maid, apparently. She got to work this morning and found the lady's body. Homicide, for sure? Well, she was a little hysterical, and that's what they gathered. No name? No, sir, not yet. You uh, notified the detectives? Uh, yes, sir, just now. Uh, that's the press again. They've been burning in here since the call was put out. 695 Park, that's a good address. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Let's roll, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look, you know as much about it as we do. The call didn't even come through here. The detectives are just on their way. With Sergeant Rosen and his operator, Patrolman McKenna, I went to the scene of the reported homicide. One of the sector men had been posted at the front door of the apartment house to keep the curious out of the entrance hall. He told us the occurrence did, in fact, appear to be homicide. We went inside and took the elevator to the third floor. The door to the apartment was standing wide open. The place was magnificently furnished. There were thick wall-to-wall -wall carpets. On instructions from me, Sergeant Rosen ordered one of the men to post himself at the front door to the apartment. Another was given instructions to man the elevator to keep the other tenants off the floor. The third to join his partner at the building entrance and admit to the building only authorized persons. I went over to talk to the maid who sat on the living room couch. She still wore the same hat she had on when she'd arrived at work. 
Poor Miss Edith. Poor Miss Edith. I'm Captain Cron. She was so beautiful. So beautiful. To walk in the bedroom like that and find her sprawled out cold. Did uh, you call the police? Yes, sir, I called the police. When I first opened the door of the apartment, I knew there was something the matter. I knew it. The television was on, the newspapers and glasses were all over the front room, and the ashtrays were full up. Miss Edith never left anything like that. Well, it looks pretty straightened up in here now. Yes, sir, I turned off the television and picked up a little. Then I went back to the kitchen. That's when I saw. The minute I saw, I knew it. Laid on the floor there in the bedroom, just stretched out. That yellow hair she had all turned every way. She always had it so neat. So neat, mister. What's your name? My name? Yes. Alberta. Alberta Dalton. D-A-L-T-O-N? No, sir, with an O. My family spells it with an O. She had bad skin like that. Who could do something like that to Miss Edith? She never hurt nobody in the world. Never nobody in the world. She cried the night. Where do you live, Alberta? 134th Street. Where on 134th Street? 406 West. Poor Miss Edith. Excuse me, Captain. Poor sweet little thing. Yes? Never hurt the nobody. The ambulance crew is here. Is there a surgeon with him? Oh, no, sir, just good. Lieutenant. All right, take him back there. Yes, sir. <laughs> Her name was Edith Campton? Yes, sir. Edith Campton, yes, sir. Does she have any family? No, sir. No family. At least not in New York. She comes from Texas. She got brothers in Texas, too, I think. Poor, sweet little girl. So sweet. Well, she must have been pretty well off to live in an apartment like this. Did she uh, live here alone? Yes, sir. All alone. She wasn't married? No, sir. Was she ever married? No, sir. Not the strong me. Did she go to business? Oh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you know, did she have a job or anything like that? Oh, no, sir. Not Miss Edith. Well, well, what did she do? She had a friend, Captain. Hello, Captain. Oh, hello, man. <laughs> Alberta. Alberta, this is Lieutenant King. He's in charge of the detectives who will take over this case. Yes, sir. Now, you tell him everything he wants to know, huh? Yes, sir. Poor Miss Edith. I don't know what I'm going to do without her. I couldn't work for nobody else. Nobody else. Where is the captain in there? Yeah. Let's take a look. You sit here, Alberta, all right? Yes, sir. It's all right. I'm not going no place. What do you think the rent is on this place, Captain? Four or five hundred a month? Something like that, I guess. Pretty steep. Yeah. Yeah, pretty steep. Oh, that watch is here in the hallway. Those those two books laying on the floor. They're just like that. Mm. Looks like someone threw them here, huh? Threw them pretty hard. They hit the wall, I guess. Uh-huh. Well, let's leave them lay for now. Yeah, in here, man. Is that King? Hi. Sergeant. Mm. Pretty dress she was wearing. She wasn't struggling with anyone. No, it doesn't appear that way. That's what she was hit with, I guess. What is it, do you think? Mm, I don't know. It looks like a fire tool to me. Mm. Who was she? What did she do, do you know? She didn't do anything. She had a friend. No. Well, the tabloids are going to have a field day with this one. Made to order for them. It sure is. Has all the elements. A mystery, a blonde, and pocket. Yes, sir. Too bad she's not around to read about it. The call had come in at 11 minutes after 8 a.m. It was now 8.32. At the moment, little more was known about the case than what we could see. A striking blonde named Edith Campton was dead from a blow across the base of the skull in her bedroom of a Park Avenue apartment. Within minutes, the apartment began to fill up with the police department specialists and experts. Detectives from the Manhattan East Homicide Squad arrived to work with detectives from the 21st Squad. As required, the Chief Medical Examiner's Office and the New York County District Attorney's Office were notified. Latent fingerprint experts from BCI and a photographer were summoned. Superior officers of the Detective Division, who had been notified in accordance with the Manual of Procedure, began to arrive on the scene. At ten minutes after nine, when I left the apartment, the investigation was well underway. On the street, a considerable crowd had gathered. The press was out in force. I suggested they direct their questions to the Chief of Detectives, 
the commander of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad and the assistant district attorney. At 25 minutes after 9 o'clock, I returned to the station house where I signed the blotter and walked over to the switchboard. Sergeant? Excuse me. This board has been humming. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Chief who? Oh, uh, uh, he's not here. I haven't seen him. Uh, but just a second. Uh, Captain, it's the borough commander's office. Did you see Deputy Chief Wilkes this morning? He was over at the scene of that homicide. Hello? He was over at the scene of that homicide we had. Is he still there, Captain? He was there when I left. He was there when Captain Cronin left. All right. Call his office. I'll tell him. Yeah. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, listen. Somebody called in here and said there was a traffic station in the second floor hall at 622 East 64th. Well, how should I know? Some drunk must have carried it in there during the night. Walk over there and take a look. Yeah. All right. How should I know how the station got in the hall? How does this uh, homicide look, Captain? Pretty heavy, Sergeant. It's all we need around here now. Another Rubenstein case. Now, what else is doing, Sergeant? A car struck a pedestrian on Lexington Avenue in 60th. Man? Man got up and walked away from it. Then he decided his back hurt. He went at the Metropolitan. Did we hold the driver? I know, sir. The man walked out from between two parked cars and ran into the side of an automobile. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. The detectives are all out. Can I help you? Well, that's what the detectives are all out on, that homicide. No, I don't know anything more about it. Okay. You're welcome. Some guy from the channel. Yeah, you'll have that all day, Sergeant. You might as well be ready for it. I know. Well, what's it look like, Captain? Hmm? What do you mean? Any idea who killed her? Well, he just started looking into it when I left. Oh. Well, how was she killed? With a, a fire tool, apparently. Well, uh, Sergeant, what time have you got Farrell and Eisman down for their meals? Twelve to one for Eisman and one to two for Farrell, Captain. Well, uh, switch them around because I'll want the car at one to take me down to the division. Yes, sir. Let Eisman take his meal at one and put him on a fixer until Farrell gets back with the car. Yes, sir. Uh, she was supposed to be a pretty good-looking babe, Captain. I imagine she was. Uh, one of those fellas in the press told me she won a beauty contest in Texas seven or eight years ago. Now, that's how she first happened to come to New York. The judges picked her unanimously. The Texas Venus, they called her. Hmm. I wonder what the judges would have said if they'd seen her this morning. Back to 21st Precinct and Captain Cronin. Homicide is, of course, the most serious crime in the books. But it's not very often that detectives are called upon to deal with a murder mystery typical of detective fiction, in which the guilty party must be singled out from a, num a number of well-known suspects. Nearly all homicides fall into two other categories. Either they're crimes committed in the heat of passion, with the killer readily identifiable and easily apprehended, perhaps within minutes after the act. Or they are felony murders, committed during the course of robbery, burglary, arson, or rape in which case the killer seldom had any previous connection with the victim. In the case at hand, there was an element of mystery. At 20 minutes past 10 a.m., I'd finished reading and signing reports and communications. I put them in the letter tray to be picked up by the precinct messenger who would take them to division headquarters for distribution. Then I sat at my desk reading the latest amendments to the Manual of Procedure concerning complaints against members of the department by civilians. 21st Precinct, Captain Cronin. Sergeant Waters, I'm to yes, Captain. Uh, Joe Dutweiler of the News is out here. He wants to see you. About what? About what? Oh. Oh. About the homicide, Captain. I'll tell him I don't know anything about it. You ought to talk to the detectives. Yes, sir. Captain says he doesn't know anything about it. Talk to the detectives. Uh, just a second. You want to see you anyway, Captain. Oh, all right. Tell him to come on in. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Who's on post number six? Singleton, Captain. All right, when he rings in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come in. Well, tell him I got a written complaint from a citizen. Hello, Captain. Hi, Joe. A uh, peddler selling fruits and vegetables from a wagon over there. Tell him if he runs across the peddler to check him, see if his license is okay. Yes, sir. Sit down, Joe. Well, this is pretty neat, Vince. Yeah. 
How do you like having your own command? Oh, I don't know yet. Haven't been on the job that long. Now you're off to a good start. Your men think you're the toughest thing that walks. Do they? Mm-hmm. So you better be good to me or I'll let them know you've got a heart of gold from way back. Just don't mention from how far back, Joe. <laughs> I won't. Big doings up here today, Captain. Well, I can't tell you anything about it, Joe. I don't know anything. I was only there for a few minutes this morning. Mm-hmm. What would the apartment look like upstairs? Plush? Yeah, yeah, it was plush, if you want to call it that. But, look, you better talk to Lieutenant King or the chief of detectives or the homicide captain. They got it all over there. We don't know anything here. Look, Vince, I got tired of waiting out there in the street. I saw all the big brass going in and none of them coming out. You know, you get awful tired standing around, first on one foot and then on the other. Now, what's the deal? Who did her in? Joe, I told you. I don't know anything. Look, you're the captain of the precinct, aren't you? I still don't know anything. What is this, the Wilhelm Strasser? Somebody's got to know something. Now, look, be patient, Joe. You've got a morning paper. You've got all day to get your story. You'll get it. I'm embarrassed to call my city editor. Don't be embarrassed, Joe. He understands. Uh, well, you never know what to talk to him. Hey, get your story out there, Joe. The chief of detectives. Excuse me, Captain. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> the muster room was alive with activity. Lieutenant Matt King of the 21st Detective Squad had walked in the door with the chief of detectives and the acting captain in command of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad. Close on their heels were reporters from all of the seven daily papers with general circulation in New York. The Associated Press and newsmen from radio and television. Lurking on all sides were photographers for most of the papers and motion, motion picture cameramen. It was apparent that these top officers had avoided talking to the press at the scene of the homicide. But now they were cornered. I walked out into the muster room where the questions were being fired at a rapid rate. Chief, did the medical examiner fix the time of death? Uh, not yet, not definitely. It was sometime during the night. It's true that Edith led a double life. Were there any uh, pictures of bring your father? Hold it down and hold it down. Hold it down and hold it down. Now listen, Chief. We don't have anything for a story yet. Nothing. Now give us a break, will you? Well, I'll tell you what we'll do, boys. There are some things we know we can't tell you yet. Give us a couple of minutes to decide what we can tell you, and you'll have a story, okay? That's fair enough. Yeah, we'll use the captain's office. Excuse us. Coming through, then. Oh, hello, Captain. Hey, Rough. It's wicked. Go back. Is it all right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, come ahead, Captain. Thanks. Don't forget, give us a break, will you? Uh, close the door. We'll find a way, those guys. I guess I'll have to tell them something, Matt. They're entitled to their story. Yes, sir, but I'd like to keep quiet about the boyfriend for a while. I don't think there's any point putting him into it yet, Chief. No, neither do I. We can tell them that Edith Campton isn't a real name, that she's just been using it since she came to New York. Yes, sir. What else? Well, she worked as a model. Not a cover girl. No, sir, for a fashion house and a store, but I think they know that. How about suspects? Who, oh, Chief? Well, supposing I say there's four or five people we want to talk to, but we can't divulge any names at this point. Yes, yeah, sir, that'd be good. Might want to mention her address and phone book that we're checking every one of her friends. I better say acquaintances. Yes, sir. Yes, that address and phone book ought to make them happy. Mm, always does. Thirty detectives assigned to the case. Uh, how's that? Fine. They want to know if there was any evidence of her being killed by a burglar or someone who entered the apartment with criminal intent. I think you can tell them the place wasn't broken into, Chief. Okay. Matt, uh, do you want to let him talk to the maid? I think all I want is pictures of her. We can go that far. Oh, and I guess that about does it. Okay, Matt, you can throw me to the wolves. Yes, sir. There he is. All right, how about it, Chief? Yeah. Who killed her? The neighbor says she had a gentleman friend. Huh? All right, well, yeah, give, him give him a chance. Give him a chance. Come on, let me get right. out here. Will you? All right, Chief. Chief, no, no, Chief, one question first, Chief. <laughs> My desk wants to get a photographer into her apartment. Now, when can we do uh, that? I'm sorry, no pictures inside oh. the apartment. Oh, no. But we're making a floor plan of the flat. You can see that as soon as it's ready. What time? What time, Matt? 1.30 at the latest. That's too late for the afternoon. Well, you can make it 12.30? Come on. Hold it down a minute. Wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it down, boys. <laughs> All right, boys. This is the story. We've got uh, 30 men on the job. At this moment, we have no more idea than you do who the killer is. There are four or five people with whom we want to talk about this. <clears throat> In addition to that, Miss Campton had a telephone and address book. You mean a little black book? What color is it, Matt? Baby blue letter. Hey, boy. In addition to the four or five, we'll be in touch with every person listed in her phone book in order to get some idea of her movements yesterday and last night. Now, as I told you before, the Emmy's office hasn't yet reported it. So, the press had their story. All that could be divulged without hindrance to the investigation was given to them. In a few minutes, the reporters hurried out of the station house to find telephones. The chief of detectives and the acting captain of the homicide squad went upstairs to the 21st squad with Lieutenant King. 
Within an hour, both had left the station house. Now started the real work of the homicide investigation. Detectives of the homicide squad teamed off into pairs with men of the 21st squad to work as partners until the crime was cleared. At 1 p.m., a car came by the station house to take me to 6th Division headquarters for a conference with the inspector who wanted a personal report on my first week as precinct commander. While I was out of the precinct, a well-dressed, graying man in his late 40s was brought in by Detective Whitey Howard of the 21st Squad and Alvin Cooney of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad. They took him directly upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad. This way, Mr. Bellary. Yeah. You don't think it'll take long, do you? I wouldn't know about that. Come in. Lieutenant, we've got Mr. Bellary here. Oh, good. Come in, Mr. Bellary. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a seat, Mr. Bellary. Thank you. Well, this is some shock. I have no, no idea what a shock when these officers told me it was like a bolt of lightning. Take a right, Mr. Bellary? No, much by Ed, Whitey? Thanks, Lieutenant. No, thank you. I'm Lieutenant King. How do you do? You know what this is all about, don't you, Mr. Bellary? Yes, I suppose so. Is Walter Bellary your full name, sir? Walter Crane Bellary. And where do you live? I have a home in Westchester. Where in Westchester? Winslow Park. Your business in New York? That's right. What is your business, Mr. Bellary? I'm a paper broker. And what is that? Well, I act as broker for mills and selling paper to printers, publishers. I see. Do you commute to New York every day? Every weekday, yes. You married, Mr. Bellamy? Yes. For how long? Nineteen years. Any children? Two. Two girls, 15 and 17. You were acquainted with Miss Tanton? Yes. For how long? Well, I don't know. Three, three and a half years, I suppose. What could I do with this? I really don't feel like smoking. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> How well acquainted, Mr. Bellamy? Oh, quite well. Did you see her frequently? Yes. How frequently? Two or three times a week. Ever oftener? Yes, sometimes. At her apartment? Yes. There, and we go out to the theater, clubs together. Was that her apartment, Mr. Bellamy? She lived there, yes. I know she lived there, but who paid the rent? Well, I imagine she did. Who gave her the money? Lieutenant, Edith and I were very close. My wife and I haven't gotten along for years. Someday I hope to marry Edith. That's the way it is. I couldn't help it. A man needs some sort of life. You paid the rent. Yes. When did you last see her, Mr. Bellary? Night before last. You didn't see her yesterday? No. No last night? No. Were you in New York yesterday? Yes. Where? I was in my office until until five fifteen. And then? I went to Grand Central and took the five thirty four home. To Winslow Park. Yeah, that's right. Was your wife at your home in Winslow Park? No. Where was she? She's visiting her sister in Boston. Your daughters, were they home? No. No, they're away at school. Oh, was anyone at your house in Winslow Park last night besides you? No. No, I was all alone. Did you see anyone you knew on the train? I think so, Lieutenant. Yes. Who? Oh. I don't recall at the moment. I'll, I'll have to think about it. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Think about it, Mr. Bowery. Well, Lieutenant, I know that this can't help coming out. This whole thing's bound to get in the papers. I don't care about myself, what anyone says about me. But those two young girls of mine, this is going to be terrible on them. Just, just terrible. This is a homicide investigation, Mr. Bellary, but 
think of those two young girls, Lieutenant. That was your job, Mr. Pellery. I've got mine. The interrogation of Walter Crane Bellery continued. So did my conference at division headquarters. It finally broke up at 3 p.m. Patrolman Farrell drove me uptown to the 21st. I instructed him to pick up his partner and resume patrol. He drove away, and I walked up the steps and into the muster room. Hello, Captain. What's doing, Sergeant? Nothing like this morning, sir. Well, that's good. Where's Lieutenant Gorman? I'm filling in for him, Captain. DA's office called from now in the hurry. Yeah? A burglary case went to bat this afternoon that he made the arrest on when he was sergeant at 64th last winter. This is a fine time to let us know, isn't it? Well, they didn't think they'd need him, but the boy denied his admission. Oh. All right. Stand right up to the desk there, would you please? Here. Okay, Whitey, let's book him. Yes, sir. Uh, just a second. Oh, man. Captain. Walter Crane. Man. Yes, Captain. What's this? That homicide. Middle name is C R A N E. Hey, that's fast work. Right. And he got twisted up in his own lies. Mm-hmm. How did it happen? When he finally told us, he said she was going to break it off. She had a guy she wanted to marry. Mm-hmm. He was so enraged, he picked up a fire iron and hit her over the head. What's the charge? Well, why did he do it? What did he say? That he killed her because he loved her. Well, if you've got to kill somebody, that's as good a reason as any. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Stole your what? Your safe. Where's this? Where on Lexington? And so it goes. What is it? Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Abby Lewis, Ralph Camargo, Mandel Kramer, Don McLaughlin, and Wendell Holmes. Written and produced by Stanley Niff. Art Hannah speaking. <laughs>